Good evening. I'm Alex Jones. I'm director of the Joan Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy here at the Kennedy School, and it's my great pleasure to have the uh, opportunity to introduce Kevin Phillips tonight. Um, as I know you know, Kevin Phillips is the author of American Dynasty, Aristocracy, Fortune, and the Politics of Deceit in the House of Bush. The Christian Science Monitor calls it a thinking person's diatribe. I think uh, actually that uh, Paul Krugman, though, characterizes it better. And he characterizes Kevin Phillips better because he frames what Kevin Phillips does as looking at what is happening in our country, what is happening, in fact, to our country. And I think that the point of Kevin Phillips' career uh, has been an examination of that question. As most of you may know, Kevin Phillips started as a Republican and was uh, one of the people in the Nixon administration. He was one of the architects of the, as he tells me, there were several, but uh, one of the so-called Southern strategies, but he certainly was uh, one who early saw the rise of a ma Republican majority, one that was going to be uh, an enduring one, at least an enduring one for, for some time, and is certainly in the power of the Republican Party in politics now is uh, quite a remarkable thing, given the uh, complexity of our country and the social issues that are uh, before us. I think that the, the sense that Kevin Phillips brings to this study of the Bushes, and it really is a book that is, while it's about the Bushes, it is also about a dynastic uh, enterprise in this country that he sees uh, repeated, not just in the Bushes, but in other dynasties as well. But his focus has been, for much of his political career, looking at the disparity, the growing disparity, that he has found between rich and poor. Uh, his book, The Politics of Rich and Poor, uh, another book, Wealth and Democracy, focus on that disparity. And the sort of underlying theme of American dynasty is, uh, is at heart about that. Some of you may know that uh, my wife and I wrote a book about another dynasty, a different kind of dynasty, the dynasty of the Ox and Sulzberger family that has owned the New York Times for over a century. Uh, that is also a dynasty. There are American dynasties, and I think that the dynasty of the Bush family is uh, one that is both illustrative and also different from others. One of the fascinating arguments that Kevin Phillips makes in his book is that dynasty can be very dangerous. And it can also be very dangerous and especially dangerous when it is in what he has characterized as the restoration phase. The dynasty exists, the dynasty lapses, and then the members of the dynasty regain power. The traits of restoration, things like same geopolitical goals over generations, the bias toward the same interests that the earlier parts of the dynasty had. In the case of the Bushes, oil, for instance, secrecy, uh, the assumption that the views of the group that are members of this dynastic order are right and that there is somehow something invested in the fact that they are successful which makes them right and makes them, even more importantly, very reluctant to question themselves. And there's also that wonderful, old, reliable, a desire to seek revenge on old foes. According to Kevin Phillips, restoration drinks from its own special psychological well. Kevin Phillips has gazed into that well, and I'm glad to welcome, here, welcome him here to tell us what he has seen. Kevin Phillips. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. I'm tempted to start by saying that uh, George W. doesn't know it, but he's starring in his own restoration comedy. <laughs> 
However, I actually have something I don't normally do, which is prepared remarks, and I'll generally stick to them. I'll probably interrupt myself a little bit, but uh, I want to make some points here tonight, basically, about not just the American dynasty, the Bush's dynasty, but some of the problems that come with the dynasty that the media in the United States have been unable to rise to either perceiving or covering. And that's sort of the approach I want to take tonight um, about the failure of the press, I mean in part at least, to grapple with the dynastic aspect of the 41st and 43rd presidencies together. I'm not making a complaint about the attitude of the press because basically they've been reasonably kind to me. I had a lot of reviews quickly and many of them were quite favorable. The book was number two on the nonfiction side in the New York Times on Sunday and uh, it's doing quite well. But I still come up with a sense that the media cannot rise to a larger occasion or haven't yet because Part of what made me write this book was my sense of something going wrong in American politics. As was mentioned, I wrote a book that came out in 1969 called The Emerging Republican Majority. And my sense is that in the process, especially in the last decade, of the later stage emergence of that Republican majority with a capital R, there has been a loss in another column, which is Republican politics and government with a small r. And the more I see of the dynastic pattern and the inherited politics and loyalties of the Bushes, uh, the more I think that's, that's a major problem. Tonight I'm gonna try to put out four themes in American dynasty that have generally been ignored by the media. The first is the unique continuity that's involved here of interest groups, major donors, key advisors, foreign embroilments, and even family grudges. It's an unusual pattern. You take the two administrations together, not separately. The second really is how the Bushes are the first presidential family to have come to power, at least in part, through the intelligence community. This is absolutely unprecedented. It involves much more than simply the fact that George H.W. Bush was director of the CIA before becoming vice president and president. As a sidebar to this, I'm going to make the case uh, superficially because there's not time to go into much depth, but in addition to this relationship with the intelligence community that they've had, the Bushes also have a two-generation pattern of abusing and misusing aspects of the intelligence community. The third point will be to look at the Bushes as the first presidential family in the United States to have had a region overseas that was essentially a focal point of their interest and their conflict of interest, both economic, political, financial, corporate. No other presidency, no other family has had this sort of connection with one part of the world. And then the fourth pattern, which sort of spins off the one that I just mentioned, is that you have, in the case of the Bushes, for the first time, you have a presidential family that has had, over the course of a quarter of a century, ties to the family of the man and faction that, two and a half years ago, attacked the United States, the Bin Ladens. Now, at the time these ties developed, Osama bin Laden wasn't what he became in the 1990s. But it is absolutely unprecedented in a situation that has involved wars for the two generations of the family of the President of the United States to have been involved with the family of the attacker. It's as if you know, George Washington had a tie to George III. They were in the Whig business together or something in London. Uh, or that Franklin D. Roosevelt had a thing on the side with Tojo, and they had an oil business in Southeast Asia. I mean, as soon as you start putting it in the historical context, it's kind of amazing. And I'm gonna come back to that in a little more detail. 
Of the people who've looked at the book, the reviewers, uh, several have actually gone pretty far to say that the media should go through and pick up a number of these themes. Jonathan Lark Yardley in the Washington Post book world said the book was, quote, devastating, an important troubling book that should be read everywhere with care, nowhere more so than in this city, Washington. Mike Oreskes in the New York Times book review described it as full of fascinating items worthy of election year discussion. But the newsrooms and editorial offices of the media, as opposed to the book reviews, have basically so far not taken the hint. Now, part of it is that my friends in the, the White House, and I use that term sarcastically, obviously, um, have suggested, and I, I heard this from people both on Capitol Hill and in some of the media in Washington, that the reason I, I did the book was that I had a personal animus towards the Bushies because they didn't telephone me or invite me to things. Now, this is a little stupid, obviously coming from people who haven't been around too long because I have a long relationship with the Bushes of having absolutely no relationship. I haven't liked them for a long time for a number of reasons. In 1990, I published a book called The Politics of Rich and Poor which had a final chapter describing how the first Bush administration pivoted on a bunch of no-talent preppies who had abandoned middle America to take the Republican Party back to cotillions and country clubs. Now, this was not a love pact. They did not regard it as a love pact. But as a measure of the factionalism in the Republican Party, the lead endorsing quote on the book jacket of the politics of rich and poor came from Richard Nixon. Uh, Ronald Reagan would probably have been willing to do it too if I'd been able to make the connection, simply because while he shared some of the economics, he didn't share the, I guess we could call it the skull and bones uh, culture. In 1992, I did a big piece for the Los Angeles Times on a Sunday that it was headlined, The Ties That Tarnish, The Web of Corruption That Surrounds George Bush. Now, most people have forgotten it, but back in 1992, there was a web of corruption. And I'll touch on that very quickly, but believe me, anything I can say in five minutes doesn't remotely do justice to what you could talk about for an hour. It was a long article. Uh, a couple of months later, in November 1992, people have forgotten, George H.W. Bush got 37 point something percent of the vote for president that year. It was the lowest re-election total for an incumbent president since William Howard Taft in 1912. And this after the man's job approval had gotten up to 89% in the wake of the Gulf War. And part of the reason it dropped so far so quickly was economic, but the other part of it were these scandals and things having to do with his brothers and his sons and their businesses. Let me turn back now, in a little more detail to these four propositions that the, starting with the one that the two administrations have to be viewed together. Now, essentially, most of this is, is pretty obvious. Presidents 41 and 43, I mean, it's a father and son combination. They sound alike in a lot of ways. They look alike. They have almost the same name. George W., for much of his life in the younger days, modeled himself on his father, tried to act like him and, and talk like him and go to the same schools and everything like that. Uh, you cannot in any sense uh, take the one or two big differentiations and put them ahead of this whole shared pattern, the shared interest groups of oil, finance, defense, intelligence, the, uh, the loyalties to the top 1%, the grudges in the Middle East, the connections with bin Laden, all of these things are threads that go through. Now, it's a new phenomenon when it comes in this form. The Adams president by, presidents, by contrast, were 24 years apart and in different parties. The two Roosevelt's were 24 years apart and in different parties, and they were only cousins. The Kennedys had only one president. I mean, what we have here is entirely different than that. Now, some people will say, okay, we, we stipulate on oil, we stipulate on a whole lot of things, 
But obviously, George W. was entirely different than his father in cultural and religious terms. And there's a lot to that, except that it's more an image than it is an underlying socioeconomic reality. But even that can be a little bit deceptive, because the way that George W. got into national politics on a major level was that in 1986, 87, and 88, he was his father's liaison to the religious right. That was what he did. And it wasn't taken so seriously that most of the books about the campaign ever picked up on it. But the recent biographies of George W. for the 2000 election have, because that was his launching pad. He made the connections with the preachers and the televangelists. He was the guy that convinced his parents to tell Jim and Tammy Faye Baker that they actually watched his Praise the Lord TV hour. Now, I can believe many things about Barbara Bush, but not that she watched the Praise the Lord TV hour. Uh, but George W. did all of this very well. And his father in 1988 did almost as well as Reagan with the fundamentalist and evangelical vote. And when George W. himself ran in 2000 with his whole shtick of religiosity and uh, uh, born again, uh, symbols and demeanor and prayer and so forth. Whereas his father had gotten about 70% of the fundamentalist and evangelical vote compared to Reagan's 75, George W. got about 84% of the fundamentalist and evangelical vote. They, constitu <clears throat> they constituted 40% of his electorate in 2000. And of course, the bias of the administration is, as a result is enormous. But his father had done very well in 1988, and if he didn't get the accent, he was pretty good at doing the kowtow. And he too, although he slackened off for a little bit during the Gulf War, basically played up to the religious right. It's too important in the Republican Party not to. Now let me go to the second issue here, that the Bushes are the first presidential family to have multi-generational roots in international business and the intelligence community. This goes way, way back, and this is a part of the Bush background that basically has not, <clears throat> has not come out really at all until just quite recently because the early Bush biographies were sort of in-house biographies. The first one that came out in 1983 was written by one of his former aides. They basically got into nothing that would be embarrassing. And the early background, frankly, is, is quite embarrassing. In the, uh, the early decades of the 20th century, there wasn't too much organized military or State Department intelligence. A lot of it came from business, especially the munitions and oil industries. And the Bushes were actually quite significant in both of those industries. Now, what I'm gonna say in the next couple of verbal paragraphs, it's very easy to document. The book has all the sources. But let's start with Samuel Bush, the current president's great-grandfather. He was the president of Buckeye Steel, which was partly owned by Standard Oil. The president of Buckeye who preceded him, he was the president of Buckeye after 1908, but his predecessor was Frank Rockefeller, who was the youngest brother of John D. Rockefeller. During World War I, Buckeye got into a gun barrel and artillery shell production. And in 1917, Sam Bush went to Washington to run the small arms, ammunition, and ordnance section of the War Industries Board. Now, the other great-grandfather was George H. Walker, a prominent St. Louis financier. He got into war loans and war production, and in 1919, Avril Harriman, who was the principal heir to the Union Pacific fortune, took George H. Walker into a partnership which set up in Wall Street under the name W.A. Harriman and Company. Now, they got involved in shipping and in aviation and in a number of major projects to redevelop Germany and Russia after the First World War. And this included everything from relations with the Thyssen steel interest to trying to refurbish the Soviet oil industry in Baku and the Caucasus 400 miles from present day Iraq. Walker also, as part of what he did, was big time into intelligence and sort of business secrecy. He became a director of the American International Corporation, which started during World War I, and was to some extent a, a combination of a, a multinational corporation 
and a business intelligence operation. Now, when Walker retired, started retiring in the 1930s, his son-in-law, George H. Walker, who was the, the current president's uh, grandfather, took over a fair number of his duties at the Harriman firm, including uh, connections with the intelligence community and defense establishment, and some of the German commercial interests with which Walker had been involved. Uh, this isn't any question about uh, Prescott Bush's patriotic role. It may be a question about his judgment. I mean, I think that some of that is very open to debate. He was a director of a banking corporation which was seized by the, uh, the government in 1942. But essentially, his connections were with the people on the intelligence and defense side. He was a director of two companies that were involved in the wartime atomic bomb project. Two of his partners at Brown Brothers Harriman were Avril Harriman, who went on later to be mutual security administrator, and Robert A. Lovett, who went on to be Secretary of Defense and after World War II blueprinted the CIA. The lawyer who handled much of the Harriman Lovett Bush firm's relationships with Germany and the rest of Europe was also pretty well known in intelligence circles. His name was Alan Dulles, and he became director of the CIA in 1953. So people who were involved in all of this stuff were, were just part of a group of people that really became a central part of the American establishment. Now, with this heritage and this background over two generations, it wouldn't be surprising if the third generation, and now we're talking about George H.W. Bush, George Sr., number 41, had gotten involved with the CIA long before Gerald Ford ever appointed him to be the Director of Central Intelligence in 1976. Now, in, uh, in getting into this, I didn't really have much idea about the extent of the literature, so to speak, but there's several dozen books and articles that have held forth on the probable connections of George H.W. with the CIA. And they cover a whole host of possibilities. They talk about being recruited at Yale, which was a major recruiting ground for the CIA, uh, having been enlisted when he was in, uh, having been put in OSS so he could get into the Navy pilots program even though he was underage and didn't qualify, which he did get into. Or, and I think this is by far and away the most plausible, that he became an asset of the CIA sometime in the late 1950s or early 1960s because his company, Zapata Offshore, was in the offshore oil drilling business in the Caribbean and the Persian Gulf, and the closeness of his family with Alan Dulles and their interest in Cuba would have made his firm a natural to have some role in the surveillance of Cuba during the Castro insurgency, and then when Castro took over, and in the lead into the Bay of Pigs. And if I had to guess, I think I would say the odds are in favor of this, even though we're talking only about circumstantial evidence. There isn't anything more than that. However, if you take the argument that, forget the question of whether this is sufficient proof, does it explain a lot of things? And I think that that it really does, because when Bush was in the CIA, and then after he became vice president and president, his later years in those two national roles were so marked by related activities and pitfalls, counterinsurgencies, illegal arms deals, secret military buildups, rogue banks like BCCI, the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, scandals like Iran-Contra, a whole bunch of cover-ups. This is not the norm for a president. It's not the norm for a president, even if you think of somebody with a nefarious business or, or labor or whatever background. It's just not what a typical vice president and president would get into. But if you have this backdrop of your family's ties and sort of sense of being able to feed off the intelligence community, it not only explains these connections, but it explains why George W. and his three brothers and this is absolutely true, have gotten into so many business deals with Saudi and Kuwaiti investors, relationships with Miami fronts for the Contras during the 1980s, cloak and dagger banks like BCCI, which was very close to Harkin Energy when it bought out George W. Bush in the late 1980s. Here again, one year of the former president being CIA director is not enough to explain this family involvement. 
Now, coming down more to brass tax, or at least possibly illegal and very uh, controversial tax, if you think about this type of relationship and the predilection on the part of the family for intelligence, covert operations, and periodic deceit, you get into the beginnings of a related pattern we're now seeing in the second Bush administration. This is the misuse and manipulation of U.S. intelligence agencies and resources. Now, before going to the question of the weapons of mass destruction in 2002 and 2003, let me go back for a minute to 1980 and the so-called October Surprise. 1980 was the election year when the Iranians, the new revolutionary government there, had seized 52 Americans as hostages. When Carter's rescue mission failed in April of 1980, it became clear that the release or non-release of the hostages would be the pivot on which the 1980 election turned. Now, the alleged October surprise misbehavior that is, as I say, alleged about George Bush and, and others in the Republican campaign is that a group of top Republicans together with a rump faction in the CIA arranged for the Iranian revolutionary government to continue to keep the hostages under lock and key rather than release them in time for the election. The Republican deal in which, as I say, some claim that Bush Sr. was involved was also said to include money and secret arms and supplies for Iran. Now, a book that came out with these arguments in 1991 was widely dismissed. There were media stories that said, no, this isn't proven, it can't be. But during 1992, congressional investigators collected some important statements and material that was basically just stored and put on a shelf after George Sr. lost the 1992 election because if the man has been slaughtered at the polls, you can sort of drop the issue. Now, they were left in storage, so they turned up in the mid-1990s, and a researcher who really had a bee in his bonnet has written about them and developed them. Broadly, what they show is that the Russian and French intelligence authorities concurred that the negotiations to delay the hostage release did take place. In addition, a late 1990s book on Israeli intelligence supported the argument of an Israeli agent who was, Israel tried to discredit him for a while, who did describe the 1980 negotiations and he too said that Bush had attended. Now, former President Jimmy Carter said years ago that he believed these negotiations had, in fact, taken place. Now, obviously, it would be an abuse and unlawful for a former CIA director to work with a rogue faction in the agency in secretly negotiating with a foreign government. It would be something that if that man later became president, you could make a good case should be impeachable, even though it didn't occur within the time frame of holding the office. But it didn't come out until the late 1980s. Now, two other scandals came out in the late 1980s. And all of this is relevant, obviously, because we now have the second part of the, of the dynasty in power, and we have another set of lies and more Mideast involvements. But of these two scandals, the first was Iran-Contra, centered on the illegal weapons shipments to Iran. This dogged Bush senior right through the 1992 election. Lawrence Walsh, the special prosecutor, later charged him in late 1992 with covering up his own Iran-Contra involvement and after he lost the 1992 election, issuing pardons to defendants like Secretary of Defense Weinberger to block more trial testimony, testimony that could have potentially been a problem for him. Now Walsh, who made these comments in the last chapter of his book, Firewall, was a former Republican Deputy Attorney General from the Eisenhower administration. Then there was Bush Sr.'s involvement from 1981 to 1990 in the clandestine U.S. war buildup of Saddam Hussein. Now this is the scandal known as Iraqgate. From 1981 to 1988, the war between Iraq and Iran provided some justification for helping Iran in order to try to keep a balance. However, when Bush Sr. became president in 1989, he continued building up Iraq even after Iraq and Iran stopped fighting. By 1992, when the U.S.-led Gulf War was over, these disclosures, all of them sort of combining, helped to push Bush's job approval from a Gulf War high of 89% down to 37% in late summer. I mean, they managed this in like 15 to 16 months, lost 52 points worth of job approval. 
Now, his son hit a peak in the early 90s, uh, right after the 9-11. And his numbers, depending on which poll you believe, are now down 48, 49, or 50. So, I mean, he's got himself a 40-point decline working now, too, if you would think in terms of some of the pattern here. Now, I want to underscore, I'm sure this is a very, very Democratic crowd, but I, I've watched the Democrats uh, in Washington fight the Bush administration for the last three years, and I've seen more hitting power in a wet Kleenex, frankly. <laughs> so I'm quoting Republicans here who have been known to fight him from time to time. Ross Perot, the insurgent Republican running as an independent, said to Bush in the 1992 debate, if you create Saddam Hussein over a 10-year period using billions of dollars of U.S. taxpayer money, step up to the plate and say it was a mistake. Pro also charged Bush with giving Saddam a green light. That's a quote to invade Kuwait, and there's a lot of detail on that. Still others charged Bush with fabricating intelligence data that showed Iraqi tanks massed to invade Saudi Arabia. There's a big debate over whether or not there were actually pictures or phony pictures, because it was alleged later that other surveillance photographs didn't show them. So what you've got here really is, I suppose, a, uh, the beginnings of a suggestion of evidence that for the United States to have in power the sort of family that has these ties to the intelligence community, but also this sort of sense of how you can game them and manipulate them. And, and when they have weak judgment to go with it, because the judgment leaves a lot to be desired too, as we've seen, and when you get cover-ups, this skill, this expertise is no asset. And obviously, the current case that we're all talking about in one way or another, that George W. either was foolish or misused or lied about intelligence data uh, involving weapons of mass destruction, well, what can you say? What I can say is that dissembling about weaponry in the Mideast in general, and Iraq in particular, is a Bush family tradition that goes back roughly two decades. So let's not take this as an individual action of an individual administration. Let's put it in a historical context. And I think this is something that is long overdue on the part of the media. Now, just, I'm not going to give anybody the names, but by way of documentation, just to make the point about how much is being overlooked, there are two books about the October surprise that have been published, dozens touching on Iran-Contra, and half a dozen laying out the details of Iraqgate. Understanding these facts and continuities would strike me as really a prerequisite to understanding how 43 has extended 41. And you can't do it legally, and there weren't enough investigations, discoveries, and subpoenas, and grand juries in the 1980s to put it together. But the historical importance is enough to justify trying to put it together. Uh, the administration, obviously, the Bushies, would like to say, well, you can't prove it, we shouldn't talk about it, you know, this is all conspiracy theory. I don't think so. Let me now turn briefly to the third topic, the uniqueness of the Bush presidencies in reflecting long-standing family business and political preoccupations with the Middle East. As I said earlier, no other presidential family ever had this sort of tie with an overseas region. Now, obviously you've got business interests, prior covert involvements, grudges, the whole panoply. You can argue from the standpoint of giving it a favorable interpretation that the essence of Bush policy has been to flood the Middle East with United States armaments, money, advisors, counterinsurgency, CIA, assets, and so forth to maintain U.S. control over the region's oil. And there's some legitimacy to this, but I think with respect to Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Saudi Arabia, you can just as easily argue that U.S. weapons, subsidies, and covert activities have produced over a quarter century destabilization and a radicalized Islam. So again, are we beneficiaries or losers? Now the unfortunate corollary is that over 40 years, the last two generations of Bushes have developed a web of personal business, financial, and corporate ties to the ruling elite in Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf. It goes all the way back to the early 1960s when George H.W. Bush had a subsidiary of his company, Zapata Offshore, I think it was Zapata Seacat, that was uh, set up purely to do business with the Emir of Kuwait in offshore oil drilling in the Persian Gulf. 
So these ties really go back four decades. It's very hard to know in a lot of these cases because of these ties with the ruling elites in Saudi Arabia and the Persian Gulf, there's a conflict of interest. Where do Bush policies begin and where do Bush clan personal and business connections and interests begin? It's very hard to say. Now, my last point here is potentially the most important of these involves the bin Laden family. This is point number four. And this is the one that is, I think is growing in significance. In 1976, 28 years ago, George Bush as CIA director enlisted a Texas businessman, James Bath, as a CIA asset. Bath had just become the North American representative for two rich Saudi families, the bin Mahfouzes and bin Ladens. Bush Sr. wanted Bath to keep him posted on what they were up to. After Bush Sr. left the CIA, Bath helped to finance the startup of George W. Bush's Arbusto oil business, supposedly used its Saudi money, partly, it seems, bin Ladens. In the 19, the bin Laden family, the bin Ladens in the sense of the larger family going back, quite an important family in Saudi Arabia. In the 1990s, the paths of the Bushes and bin Ladens crossed again when Bush Sr. and the bin Ladens were both financially involved in the famous Carlyle Group, which principally invested for a while in US defense and security firms, an interesting bias. One of the Carlyle subsidiary companies helped to train the Saudi special police. That's the one that puts down the insurgencies against the royal family. So it may be that Osama bin Laden, the multimillionaire family black sheep who became a terrorist in the 1990s, was partly radicalized by the Saudi-Washington collusion. Certainly a large number of people in Saudi Arabia were radicalized. We don't know what the effect of all these connections was on either the origins, the circumstances, or the investigations before and after 9-11. But one reason we don't know why we don't know is that the major national media have, by and large, not pursued the Bush bin Laden family ties. The public's right to know, and I underscore this, once a war cry of the Washington newsroom, there's my old Republican memories coming back into play. The public's right to know seems to be yesterday's trumpet, not today's. Where is the public right to know about all of this that you might want to think about the next time you spend an hour going through airport security? Where's the public's right to know? I didn't start American Dynasty with any real focus on this last aspect, the, the Middle East and the Bin Ladens. Uh, but as I did research and finished the last chapters, it, it began to take on more and more of a significance in the sense that somehow in this 25 years of intelligence and conflict of interest and, and economic conflict of interest and embroilments. There's a story that we haven't had yet. Now, as they say in the book trade, <laughs> my mind is already on the revisions and extensions and enlargements for the paperback version. Uh, somebody said to me recently, you know, just be patient, they'll do it all before you have to write the paperback. I hope not, but it's possible. Thank you for your interest and attention. Kevin Phillips has agreed to take uh, some questions. We have microphone here, here, one up here, one up here. If you would, uh, when you ask your question, please identify yourself uh, because we are recording this. And if there are questions, please, uh, as I say, go to the mics. Let me, uh, if I may, begin the questioning, Kevin. You have been critical of the media. Uh, do you fault the media for lack of enterprise, or do you see something more pernicious? Oh, I think there's a certain amount of lack of enterprise. I think there's also a lack of desire to rock boats in terms of uh, the White House will retaliate against people they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis who, who do rock the boat, who write the stories they don't like. I also think that the media, having become increasingly corporatized, are more interested in entertainment and less interested in, at least as a general rule, in breaking a lot of these stories that could produce retaliation, say, by the FCC, which is pretty powerful retaliation. I wouldn't want to single any of these out with any particular ratio for any particular media conglomerate, but I think the net effect 
has been to cripple a lot of discussion. It, it, nobody really wants to go first. Now, when I look back at 1992 and the way in which all these scandals that involved George H.W. Bush slowly but surely came to the fore, it was like a one, two, three punch. He got punched by the October surprise in the spring of 92. He thought he had that under control. Iran-Contra bites him in the autumn. The uh, Iraq gate situation, the arming of Saddam Hussein became a major focal point in May and June of 1992, and by the autumn, Bill Sapphire of the New York Times, who'd been a Republican White House aide back in uh, the late 60s and early 70s, he refused to endorse Bush for re-election because of Iraq gate. So all of this did finally bite, and it bit hard. But again, there was not a whole lot of achievement on the part of the major media in, in unearthing much of this before it was really under their noses and they had plenty of time to do it without looking like they were the first to do it. The, the great bulk don't seem to want to break a whole lot of new ground today because the, you know, the first one that runs in, into a no man's land gets shot. Up here. Hi, my name is Ellen Kagan. Why do you think the Democrats have not been able to fight the Bushes at all, and what's going to happen during this campaign? Will they bring up these points at all? I think they're getting better, but it's sort of like the Soviet economy after 1917. It had nowhere to go but up. Um, they've seemed to me in the, in the primaries to become a lot more spirited, and I think you have to give Howard Dean a lot of credit for that. He had too big a mouth and it did him in, but it really got him started, and he had the, uh, the baseball bat that made a lot of kneecaps sore and, and uh, it made a lot of other Democrats convinced, hey, if you know he can do it, we can do it too. And they got a lot more gutsy than they had been. Uh, John Kerry, I realize I'm in, in the heart of Kerry country in a sense, but he doesn't seem to evoke a huge amount of enthusiasm from anybody I know, even the most diehard Bush despises. So I think the Democrats may have their work cut out for them. I, I'm told he finishes strongly in the elections as he did against Bill Weld, and maybe so. Um, the Republicans have an awful lot of advantages with the incumbency and the huge amount of money they had, and I think Kerry has a chance to win. I mean, he's certainly ahead in the polls right now. There was a poll in Arizona that was published yesterday in uh, the Phoenix newspaper that showed it neck and neck in Arizona. The Democrats neck and neck in Arizona, if you could freeze that for history, the Democrats would win. But it's a long way to the election. And sometimes incumbents finish strongly at the end, and sometimes they just disintegrate even more. I don't think the die is cast. I think the Democrats have been weak sisters. Uh, I think they're going to do better this year, but I don't know whether they'll do enough better. Yes, sir. My name is John Carlton Foss. I have a question about the election. Uh, George H.W. Bush. Uh, was described as running a lax campaign, and you just said that there were three scandals that were emerging, and my impression uh, during that election was actually that uh, Bush may have, in some sense, thrown the election so that he wouldn't have to be subjected to further scrutiny. Is there any merit to that or not? You know, I don't think so. It's not typical of a politician to do that. On the other hand, he was obviously quite alert to the potential for embarrassment, which is why he pardoned Cap Weinberger right before Christmas in 1992. So if he had been reelected, there having been a Democratic Congress, he would have had a, a tough time. And it was the loss that took him out from under the searchlight. But the, the thing had not developed a, a, a terribly rough legal edge. There was a lot of politics. But the mechanics really hadn't been put in place to mobilize the whole legal issue. He was able to keep the uh, Justice Department from supporting a special prosecutor on the Iraq gate issue. And the reason for that, he appointed an attorney general who had worked with him when he'd been at the CIA. And this guy, whose name was Barr, basically just blocked everything and it would have involved a special prosecutor. This was not a well-known story in 1992. In other words, you started out the presidential election year. Most people wouldn't have had a sense that this was a major thing on the horizon, the interaction of these three scandals. They weren't developed very well by the media or the Democrats, but I was still very much involved at that point in time, and 
I don't remember spending a whole lot of time thinking about them either. I enjoyed seeing Perot do the number on George H.W., and that was sort of the, uh, the thing that I was watching. I mean, obviously, Ross Perot had a wire that should have gone to an A terminal that went to a B terminal. <laughs> but, you know, as a little device for, you know, juicing George H.W., he was terrific. So I guess everybody was asleep at the switch in 1992. Hi, my name is Josh. I'm a freshman at the college. Uh, my question is this. It's often said that um, this Bush administration is in many ways a reaction against the first Bush administration um, and that uh, George W. Bush doesn't want to alienate the right wing. He decided to take out uh, Saddam. To what extent do you think that's true or do you think that um, this presidency is motivated by its own set of factors? I think there are certain ways in which the second Bush presidency is a tactical reaction against some of the mistakes of the first. Uh, obviously, they're putting out a much more defined appeal to conservatives. They have the religious right locked up, and they're feeding them. Uh, you look at a typical Bush speech from back in January, February, March of 2003 before the Iraq war. You see it has superficial religious language, but then some of the divinity professors have gone in and seen that it was coded actually to raise stanzas from hymns and uh, portions of the Bible and, and episodes and, and likewise for certain things uh, for Catholics that have been sprinkled in there that are specific. Uh, so there's a lot of gamesmanship going on. The other thing that, that George W. did that his father could never do is he's 100% Texan. I mean, the old man always had his preppy watch band on, and part of him was always in Greenwich, Connecticut. But George W., I mean, walks and talks like a Texan and does all that, and uh, people in New England don't care for him that much. I mean, certainly, I, I imagine around here, but even in, in my town in Connecticut, which is a Republican town, he doesn't make it. They don't like him. So I think what you've got is a very, very unusual hybrid with George W. He's got the interest groups of the family, but he's got some of this Texas and fundamentalist edge that the old man didn't have. And much as I wasn't crazy about the old man, at least he wasn't going to be having a Middle Eastern policy that was uh, you know, taken out of a uh, uh, televangelist video on Armageddon in the end times. <laughs> because some of the Bush allies in the fundamentalist and evangelical community were really talking up, supporting the president, and guess why? Because Baghdad is the new Babylon, and that all of this is foretold and we're acting it out. Unless you think this is just Protestants and Christians, you've got a whole bunch of right-wing Jews in Israel doing a lot of the same stuff, and obviously a lot of the Islamic flakes are on a basically similar wavelength too. I mean, it's too bad you can't solve all of this with a, a limited Armageddon in which you have 2,000 participants chosen carefully from all the flakiest churches in the South and the craziest synagogues in Israel and the biggest nutcases in Islam, and they can all fight it out. It would be a Mel Gibson movie, you know. Uh, uh, yes, my name is John Lampert, and I'm, I'm just wondering what... What kind of take do you have on the, the, the character of George W. Bush? I mean, he, if, he, if he's not in a, in a, a, a controlled environment giving a, one of his flowery speeches prepared by his speechwriters, he comes across as a stumbling bumpkin. I mean, is, is this guy really as, 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 as stupid and ignorant as, as he sometimes appears to be? And is he, is he, a, is he a puppet for these, you know, for, the, for Wolfowitz and for, uh, you know, uh, Rumsfeld and of course uh, Cheney and, and uh, it's just it just it seems like he's so unqualified to be president. I mean, <laughs> there have been plenty of others who've been unqualified too. Uh, uh, I mean, agreed, agreed. But well, no, just go back and look at the pre-Civil War history. Try Millard, Fillmore, Franklin Pierce, and James Buchanan if you want a hot trio. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's not the first time. But in answer to your question, I would say that some of the time he is as stupid as he appears to be. Some of the time. Uh, <laughs> Not all the time, because I think he's got a certain level of smarts, and the people who know him and don't like him but know him think, think that he's sort of a mediocre intelligence with a towel-snapping fraternity boy view of the world, but you go wrong if you think he's stupid. 
and that he's got a sense of retail politics, but they don't do concepts particularly. That's <laughs> not part of the family agenda, and because I know you'll enjoy it, I'll take a minute here and explain the dynastic biological problem. I can explain it as a biological problem because I can't explain it in any more depth than that, but it has to be physiological, biological, something. Uh, essentially, they appear to have short attention spans. <laughs> they do, yeah. And they can't sit still for very long, and they don't want to burrow into a concept for very long. When George W. was governor, he used to like to play electronic golf in the afternoon. But when they really play golf, some of you may remember, they play speed it up golf. They play 18 holes in an hour and 40 minutes. Now, how could you do this? I mean, the only way you would is if you had an attention deficit problem. But <laughs> it's not purely an attention deficit problem, and it's not dyslexia because he can read from a teleprompter. Uh, <laughs> Neil, his brother, was dyslexic. You know, this is the crazy one who had the, uh, the sex tour of Asia recently and everything. Uh, Neil, he's a fun boy. Um, but George W., they say, is not dyslexic, but they think he may have something that's somewhat similar because he and his father and actually one of the grandfathers and one of the, on the Bush side, one of the great-grandfathers, they have fabulous memories. They can memorize all kinds of things. They can memorize, as George W. did, all kinds of baseball statistics. So he can lock in on that, and you're tempted to say, idiot savant. No, not that either. But it's something interesting. It's hard to know. Attention deficit, don't do concepts, can't concentrate on things terribly well for a long amount of time, get bored in cabinet meetings. I mean, O'Neill said one time he thought he had a, a game in there with him in a cabinet meeting. I mean, <laughs> O'Neill was immensely impressed, too, as many people are. Um, <laughs> But I don't know what it is exactly that they have. But when you get these dynasties in European history of the Habsburg chin, you know, a lot of the Spanish kings were nuts, uh, you run a risk. Right. We're running a risk. <laughs> Hello, my name is PJ Kim, and I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. Um, in terms of the future of the Republican Party, how well will the Southern strategy hold that you predicted as demographics change over the next 20, 30 years? And how do you feel personally about your own role in in implementing this strategy, and um, at what point did you realize that it had been hijacked into something that you didn't want? Oh, the strategy we had in 1968 was really very easy, because when you had a Wallace third party movement, you weren't going to carry the Deep South. Our strategy was to carry the Outer South, and it's all spelled out very carefully, but very elaborately in, in the emerging Republican majority. You would then get the Deep South after the third party effort had exhausted itself, because even though they wouldn't be happy with the Republicans, they'd prefer them to the Democrats. And it basically worked out almost like that. I mean, I don't have any problems. I'm, at this point, still in many ways a historiographical Republican. I just did a biography of McKinley for the Arthur Schlesinger President Series, and I totally took the Republican view on that. And I basically won in the 60s, too, because I'd just gotten out of law school in 1964 and went to Washington, and I worked as an administrative assistant to a Republican congressman from New York. And I got the sense of the liberals and Democrats failing on every dimension. They failed in a war policy. They failed in economics. They got inflation and a collapsing dollar. They failed in sociology. They failed in law enforcement. I think that that was a classic watershed failure that they did. And because they didn't understand it, they were basically trying to fight their way out of it for 20 years without realizing what had happened to them. I think the Republicans are in many ways at that same point now. And the Democrats don't understand how vulnerable the Republicans are, really any better than a whole lot of Republicans in 1960. Six and 68 when a lot of them were afraid of their shadows and they wanted to play imitate the Democrats. Uh, but I don't, I don't have any qualms about working for the watershed in the 60s. Obviously, though, these things never work out like, quite like you want it. And when I got to Washington in the Republican cycle, there were a whole lot of old Democrats. I say old because they were then the age I am now and they were all unhappy with the New Deal, and it turned out awful, and this happened, and that happened, and so forth. 
it just goes that way. You're going to have a lot of different views about what happened 30 years earlier than, than you have when you're 60 or 70. What about the future? Is the demographics change in the race? Well, the demographics are always more complicated than any one trend. And there were a whole bunch of democratic books. I mean, I can't remember any of them. But that's been the case for the last 20 years. They keep writing these books about how the Democrats are going to win, and it doesn't happen. Uh, basically, the thing that was going to change American demographics in the 90s, and maybe if Clinton hadn't been Clinton, it could have worked. I mean, if he had had a, a moral quotient to match his intelligence quotient, for example, uh, I think you could have had a different outcome of history. But the way it went, the Democrats looked like they had a lot of future based on the whole trend towards a, uh, a white collar electorate and the communications and technology trends. Of course, some of them turned out to be a bubble. And the, uh, the heavy immigrant growth that would tend to favor the Democratic Party. Except in some places, it doesn't favor them very much. So all of this would have looked like demographically, it should have made a big difference. But then you've got 9-11. And the Democrats are regarded in this country basically, although polls don't generally ask it bluntly, as the feminine party to the Republicans' masculine party. And therefore, if you're going to be attacked by all these nuts and burn nooses, you don't want the feminine party, you turn back to this swaggering, I was going to say a noun I won't use, uh, swaggering president who acts like a Texan and you know, talks about the Alamo and is tough. And I mean, that just totally skewed the whole thing and your demographics weren't worth beans in those polls taken six months after 9-11. So I don't know what's coming. Good evening, my name is Gary Flowers. I'm a fellow in the Institute of Politics this spring. There was a time in history where the media were drawn from lower classes uh, economically. To what extent do you connect the acquiescence uh, of the media today in backing off of 43 and his record prior to 40 years old and his father and grandfather to the fact that many of the media representatives now come from the same elite schools and same elite background as does the, the, the president and his, his uh, foreparents? Well, there's no doubt about that. Uh, you can also fairly say that most of the media names that the average person here would have heard of uh, would be in the top 1% income-wise. Now, I would have agreed with that a lot before two years ago, but when I started working on this McKinley book, it was interesting to see how the 1896 and 1900 elections were really the first elections fought in the period where you had these new weekly magazines and daily papers emerging, very powerful, the Hearst and Pulitzer uh, uh, chains and so forth. And people that worked for them and for the new magazines were actually paid pretty well. They'd make like $1,500 a year or $2,500 a year when the average worker was making 300 or 400 a year. So that as the new forms of media were arising at that time, you were getting people who were fairly well paid in there. They, they had the same income as a reasonably successful lawyer in a middle-sized town in Massachusetts or Pennsylvania. So I'm not certain that, I think it's a factor, I don't think it dominates. That's but, the income, how about? Um, wealth and culture. Wealth and culture. Well, the culture is somewhat different, but on the other hand, it's pretty regional. I would say that the, the people who have the upper income backgrounds and, and well-known names in the media in Washington are out of a different upper class culture than George W. is. When George W. went back to Yale, uh, I don't think he's very happy to go back to Yale. I think it aroused some uh, very mixed memories, but he did make the point that, uh, he, that he was there as president showed that there was a lot to be said for being a C student. So basically, uh, what, what he represents is, is not what the uh, upper class professionals represent. If he had not been named Bush, I think he'd be a second vice president of the Second National Bank of Amarillo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the name is Saul Bowman. Uh, I listen to your commentaries on NPR with interest. 
And I was wondering if you ever get an idea, a sense of what impact they have on Republicans. Well, it depends which ones they are. Uh, I did one a couple of weeks back that talked about how absurd it was for George W. to have picked Larry Silberman as the co-chairman of the Intelligence Committee. Because uh, Larry Silberman, and I knew this from working on American Dynasty, had been involved in the fringes of the October Surprise and the deal with Iran back in 1980, and was attacked by the special prosecutor on the Iran-Contra issue, because Silberman, as a uh, judge of the uh, Federal Court of Appeals in the District of Columbia, uh, went so far in trying to uh, undercut the ability of uh, the prosecutors to present their case in one of the Iran-Contra trials that uh, Walsh, the special prosecutor, wrote in his book, Firewall, that uh, he had almost sent a letter to the House Judiciary Committee requesting disciplinary proce processes against Silberman for misconduct. So here you got Larry Silberman, who was probably involved in two cover-ups, October Surprise and Iran-Contra, and George W. was nominating him to be the co-chair of the intelligence investigation. Now, the Democratic co-chair was Chuck Robb. Chuck Robb doesn't do a lot. He's there as a Democrat who won't make waves. So basically, Larry Silverman was the one given the ball. So I did a commentary in which I said, Judge Larry Walsh, the Republican special prosecutor, said this. We have to look to Senator John McCain, Republican, on that commission to stymie Silverman. And if they still have appointments left, and they did, a really good one to appoint would be Scott Ritter, who was the Marine Major, who was a weapons inspector, who was a registered Republican, but he's calling for Bush's impeachment. Uh, you put him on, but I said, they're not likely to do this because they, you know, they, they'd rather hug a cobra. Uh, and then I wound up the column by saying that, uh, you know, uh, what was it? It was Ritter is one of the growing number of Republicans who think we need a new president. You know. I actually got some nice Republican response on that, but it mostly came from uh, men and women in the Northeast over 55. <laughs> uh, John Reedy, uh, Shorenstein uh, Advisory uh, Group. Uh, uh, it, it's long seemed to me that the, probably the best comparison of, of these Bushes is with Louis the Fourteenth and Louis the Sixteenth of France, who uh, really were so anti-democratic that they produced a revolution, and one of them lost their head. I'm not sure which is the Fourteenth and which is the Sixteenth. Well, but how is it was smart? So there's no good parallel. <laughs> but how is it possible that people <coughs> with basically such good educations can have such an anti? Uh, democratic and an anti-social policy. I mean, the, the elimination of estate taxes, the rollback of taxes on the rich. Does this all come out of this uh, group, or is it the fact that, like George Bush Sr. had never been to a grocery store? Do they just not understand yeah. the people? Because I think that's why they're yeah. despised, because they have no understanding of the Well, there are two man. parts to that question. The first is uh, Louis the Fourteenth and Louis the Sixteenth. I'll take a little bit of the Louis the Sixteenth analogy, but Louis XIV was the Sun King. He was shrewd and tough, and he lasted about 50 years, and he's not a Bush. Uh, now, the, the second part of it, where did they develop this, what I call, inheritor and investor economics? And they developed it over four generations by being in business working for inheritors and investors. I mean, on one page of the book, I can't remember them all here, but I made a list of the different brokerage investment firms and banks that members of the core Bush family had worked for. And there were somewhere between 20 and 25, and this wasn't exhausting any kind of list. I mean, that's what they do. That's what they've done for four generations. Their whole view is, what do you do so that the people who have money get more money? It isn't complicated. If your family has done it for four generations, and that's what your friends are all about, uh, I mean, you pick somebody that comes from that background and put them in the White House, don't be surprised at what you get. 
And this is something that I think Republicans around the country really need to know because, as I mentioned, there was no dispassionate outside biography of the Bushes written until after, uh, well, one came out in 1992 that was just a study of the first Bush administration, but the first real biography came out in 1998. So people don't know anything about them. And when the second Bush came in, essentially what happens, the media said, okay, new presidency now. And since a lot of the young reporters don't remember anything that happened more than three years ago anyway, that was convenient. Uh, I'm, I'm not joking about that. I've had a number of children go through uh, history courses in the last uh, two decades. Uh, you talk about kids who were born in 1976 and talk about 1968. Oh, that's history, Dad. <laughs> you know. So people in the reporting business don't know a whole lot about it either. But anyway, they, uh, if they go in and they, they look at what these people have done, I mean, all four of the Bush siblings are either in the financial side of the oil business, I'm talking about George and Jeb, you know, before they were in politics, they were in the financial side of the oil business or they were in investment hustling. You've got Neil, who was an investment hustler, and you've got Marvin, the fourth one, that doesn't get much attention, and he's part of a hedge fund in Virginia and he's been a director of a number of companies uh, owned by the Kuwaitis. The previous generation, George H.W.'s three brothers, they were all in the investment business. That's what they did. If you want a nice one-sentence description of their loyalties, they've been tax shelter salesmen. So I don't know why anybody is surprised, but on the other hand, if you're the media and you've never bothered to write a story about all this, it's not surprising that people are surprised. First, I'd like to ask that you put, oh, sorry, Michael Blyweiss. First, I'd like to ask that you put some of your books on audio tape so that I can listen to them when I'm driving in the car. And my question actually harks back to an earlier book of yours about the rise of the religious right. You know, in the Constitution, there's a prohibition against the religious litmus test for holding public office. And yet, over the past 20 years, it seems like I mean, I don't expect to live long enough to see an avowed atheist get elected to public office. And I'm wondering you know, how that came to be and what can be done about it. Well, the historical pattern involved there is that the colonists were very sensitive, as were dissenters in England, uh, Britain itself, to the, what was called the Test Act. Now, the Test Act required to hold most offices, not all, but most significant offices, you had to belong to the Church of England. Uh, it wasn't a test as to whether or not you were religious, it was a test of whether or not you belonged or you would take the sacraments of this one denomination. Now, a lot of dissenters would be conformist in the sense that they would say they were Anglicans and they'd go on being Presbyterians. In some places you could get away with it, in some places you couldn't. But abolishing, in essence, the test was abolishing the preference was abolishing an established church. Now, it was abolished in Virginia, which had the Anglican church. It wasn't abolished. Uh, would anybody like to guess which was the last state to abolish its established church? Massachusetts, that's right. Massachusetts and Connecticut and New Hampshire, all the Congregationalist strongholds. Because where the Congregationalists were in charge, you know, it sort of puts your finger on the Anglicans, just the way the Anglicans would do to them if they had a shot. So part of the whole American decision-making process in the 1790s and late 80s was that you have so many different churches, especially in a place like Pennsylvania. Uh, you can't possibly have a national uh, church or a state church on a national basis, but they didn't override the ability of states to maintain it. And you could under the interpretation of the constitutions of the states until the 18. I think it was the 1830s when the uh, Congregationalists were disestablished in Massachusetts. It's the sort of thing that people confuse in terms of legal analysis. The Test Act was aimed against a denomination, not against religion. Hi, Morris Cunningham. Uh, with the exception of the last question, we've kind of skirted around the question of religiosity, uh, perhaps putting it on a more tactical, political level. But do you have a sense that the President has a worldview uh, informed by his uh, religious perspective uh, that places us as a unique great power, one that can do nearly anything and can justify nearly anything we wish to do based on our uniqueness. 
Well, you have to remember that previous great powers back in the 16th or 17th century would do some of the same things and justify it religiously. The King of Spain was his most Catholic majesty, and when they sailed against England with the Armada, you had all the crosses up on the masts and everything. The uh, King of France was his most Christian majesty, and they would switch sides, but they'd say that God was with them, whatever they did. The Germans had God is with us on their belt buckles in you know, French and uh, Franco-Prussian War. The uh, Queen is still in England, the defender of the faith. So this has been going on for a long time. But what's happened with Bush, in my opinion here, is that his re religious experience in the 1980s, in 1985 and 86, was probably more genuine than not genuine, but it overlaps with the collapse of the price of oil down to $9 a barrel, which destroyed his business, and it overlaps with his more or less falling into a uh, glass of bourbon. Now, it doesn't mean that it isn't genuine because a lot of conversions have come out of times of tribulation. But as you, you watch the way in which religion seems to have affected him, one of the most interesting things to do was a little depressing too when I was pulling together some of the research, get all the stuff that, in which people quoted George W. or he was talking about how his, his faith had come to him. And it's really quite clear that he has said in a number of places back in 1999 and 2000, God wanted him to run for president. God told him to run for president. Uh, after 9-11, he was saying in a number of places that he believed God had chosen him to lead the United States during this period. Now, he's never answered questions about whether his particular brand of Protestantism, which is really no longer Methodism or Wesleyanism, but it's hard to describe what it is, he's never been required to ask, answer questions about whether he believes in Armageddon. 46% of American Christians do. Does he believe in the end times? Does he believe in uh, dominionism, which is that Jesus won't come back unless there's a government of the godly? I mean, that's semi-theocratic. Uh, several church groups have said he should be quizzed on this, but he never has been, so we don't know what he thinks. But I have the sense, and just my own interpretation, and, and I am no theologian, as my wife says when I go to church three times a year. Uh, I believe that why, why this all worked for him was because he needed to be somebody after he pulled himself out of the bourbon bottle and that he became somebody as he started to put himself in this glorified role. And he thought, I believe he thinks that God wanted him to run for president. I really do think he thinks that he's been charged with this role. And I think he may well think that Baghdad was a second Babylon. And if he does, he's gonna have a little problem in major parts of the United States, but who's gonna ask him? Uh, the most recent thing is that Pat Robertson informed us that God told him that George W. was going to win. So, obviously a lot of people are having conversations. I'm not sure how many of the reporters, I mean, to come back to my favorite subject, which agnostic is gonna ask him the question? I mean, all of the, there are people in the White House press corps that, that go to church or synagogue, but probably not a whole lot that go very often. I don't think anybody would want to draw attention to themselves by phrasing anything in this context. I think there's going to have to be church groups that somehow have some sort of symposium. I don't know. Kevin Phillips, thank you.